Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I am in the middle of grading. I've graded half of the problems for everyone in both this class and the, um, the online class. So the way it, I do it is I print everything and then I grade everyone's number one and then I grade everyone's number two. That helps me um, stick to my rubric better. And then it helps me also so that if I see people making the same mistakes, um, that I am awarding them the same number of points, okay? So it helps me in, in terms of fairness. Um, if I grade everyone's number one and then go back and grade everyone's number two and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so I hope to finish by today because I was able to do about half of it yesterday and I don't have um, my pre-cal class today. So yesterday, a lot of my time was taken from the having to do the lecture for the pre-cal class. But today I don't have the pre-cal class, so I should be able to finish um, all of the grading today. Okay, so that's my goal. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll put your feedback somewhere and then I'll send out a message, maybe even some, um, oh, what is it called? Screenshots to show you where to find that um, feedback, okay? So moving forward, I'm going to share my screen so that we can see the um, timeline. So today we're going to uh, start P.2, but we're really just going to concentrate on the radicals. So we're going to do radicals and their properties and then simplifying radical expressions. When the notes start to get into rational exponents, that's where we're going to stop, okay? Because that will be the topics that we cover um, in the next class period. Okay, on um, tomorrow. So let me drag this little bar out of my way. And then, so this is where we left off. These are the objectives that we're going to cover today. And then we'll actually cover the bottom two the next time. And if I remember correctly, um, I don't even think that we cover scientific notation in this class, but I could be wrong. I just it's been a while since I looked at this uh, timeline. So it may be in there, it may not be, I'm not sure. Um, and then for the contents, we're probably going to go up to example four and then we're going to, um, oh no, we're gonna go all the way to example six and then we'll do the rest of it the next time. If we don't get all the way to example six, it's okay because the rational exponents lecture is not gonna be as long as today's lecture. Okay, so if for some reason I don't get all the way to example six, we can still use the next class period to finish up the P.2, okay? But P.2 will be broken up into two pieces. So our first rule here is to talk about integer exponents, which basically just means whole numbers, but they could be positive or they could be negative, okay? And they could be zero. Zero is an integer. It's not necessarily, it is a whole number. It's just not a counting number. There are all kinds of groups of numbers. And then for the most part, we have only been dealing what we call real numbers. And eventually next week, we'll start talking about other types of numbers called imaginary numbers, okay? But for right now, we're just dealing with real numbers. And in the real numbers group, there are subgroups, and one of those subgroups is called integers, okay? So positives, negatives, one, two, three, four, five, no fractions, no decimals, okay? Um, and no square roots that are not um, perfect square roots, okay? So they first want you to understand what an exponent means, and we kind of have already addressed that on the first test, when we had a problem, I believe it was something like two minus five X in parentheses, and then it had a square on the outside, right? And we, we talked about that in the class and we said that the square meant that you had to multiply that thing in the parentheses times itself. So there had to be two of those factors exactly the same. That's literally the definition of exponents. So if you have all these factors that are the same, a times a times a times a times a, you can write that in its exponent form and you just tell me how many a's you're gonna multiply together. And so that's what we use um, the exponent to symbolize. 
Same thing if I'm going to multiply a bunch of negative fours. I just need to know how many negative fours I'm going to multiply, and that's what the exponent represents. Even if it's whole expressions, it could be small expressions like 2x, but it also could be expressions like 2 minus 5x, like you saw on the test. Okay. It could be long expressions as well. So um, we also need to define the different parts of an expression that is in exponent form. So we know that the exponent is what we call the superscript. It's the little tiny thing that's lifted up in the font. So this little n right here, that is in, when you're typing, that position that it's in is called a superscript. Subscripts are when the number or the letter is down here at the bottom of the A. OK, let me see if I can um, annotate. Yeah. So if I would have had, dun, 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 there we go. So if you would have had something right here at the bottom, that's called a subscript. And when you have something up top, that's called a superscript. So you have sub at the bottom and super at the top. When your expression has a superscript, okay, that's the one at the bottom. I mean, I'm sorry, the one at the top. The superscript is the exponent, okay? The thing, whether it's just a monomial or it's a whole expression, whatever it is that has that superscript is called the base. So in this case, A is called the base, and then the N is called the exponent, okay? And it's important that you know that because um, as we keep going along, you will keep hearing me say base and exponent. And then later, 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 like later in the semester, when we get to the college algebra stuff toward the end, um, we're going to be talking about bases and exponents again when we get to logarithms because logarithms also have um, exponents and bases or equivalent expressions to those, okay? So you'll definitely hear these words again, exponents and base. And then as we um, read these things, we normally say that this expression, um, the A with the superscript in, is called A to the nth power. So it's the base to the whatever that superscript is, power. Okay, now we have lots of properties of um, integer exponents. Now, one thing that you have to be sure with all of these properties is that you understand that A has to be a real number. So notice on the property on all the left-hand side, one through eight, um, A and B, you see those letters as the bases. A and B. So when it comes to those A and B bases, they must be real numbers. It says that here. A and B must be real numbers. So when we do get to the section where we talk about imaginaries, none of these rules apply to that. Okay, because those are not real, they're imaginary. But for now, we're going to be talking about real numbers and we can um, use these properties to simplify them. So M and N also have to be integers because notice that the M's and the N's in one through eight are all in the position of where the exponent is. And remember this whole section so far is only talking about integer exponents. So no decimal exponents, no fraction exponents. Um, it's all integer exponents. So now that's a lot of properties and we're gonna use all of these when we're simplifying one through eight. Now they have some examples there just so you can see, like we already know if I have X squared times X to the third, you're gonna add the exponents together and get X to the fifth, right? We've been practicing these, um, but there are properties behind the scenes that are allowing us to do that, okay? And I know that when we divide, we usually take the top exponent minus the bottom exponent, and that's property two. Um, some new ones that you may or may not have seen before is um, when you have a negative exponent. A negative exponent actually just means 
that it's going to, um, if you have a fraction bar, it's going to flip its position over that fraction bar. Okay, now let me show you what I mean. I'm going to jump over to my paper. And I'm going to show you what I mean about that negative exponent because the rule doesn't really do it justice. Um, make sure that you do um, pin my video so that you can see the paper. For some reason, it's lagging on me. So just give me a moment. Let's see. OK, that's me. And now I want it to read my camera. For some reason, it's not letting me open my camera. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, but I am having some issues with Zoom. I had to log out and then log back in. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. It's just not responding for me.
Okay, it's not letting me, let me know if you can hear me because this thing is not working. <laughs> Been spending a few minutes already trying to figure out what's going on. But if you can hear me, let me know in the chat or you can come off of mute and let me know that you can hear me and you can see my screen. It's both. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Um, it's not letting me share my camera. So that <clears throat> is for some reason an issue for this Zoom thing. So I'm just gonna have to scribble on this thing. I really don't like annotating, but <laughs> I really don't have a choice right now because Zoom is not being nice to me. So what I was going to uh, tell you guys is that we have this rule here that says if you have a to the negative n power, that it basically can be written as a fraction, right? Um, a to the negative n power, and it can be written over one. Anything can always be written as over one if you wanna convert it to a fraction. And then what that negative exponent does is remember there's always an invisible one there, okay? What it does is it keeps that invisible one there you have that one that's down there that you put there. And then the negative exponent essentially moves the a to the n downstairs and it becomes positive. However, because there's nothing upstairs, you have to have something. So that invisible one becomes a visible one. And then this visible one downstairs becomes invisible. And so then it looks exactly like this fraction that you have here in the image that I circled, okay? And it goes the reverse. So I noticed that nowhere in the rules does it show me what happens if you have one over a to the negative n, okay? And that one is very much the same. So you have this invisible one in the front, and then the visible one is on top, the invisible one is at the bottom, but the negative exponent will make that a to the n go to the top. And so that now it's not negative. And then you really don't have to write the visible one. And when you have a fraction over one, you don't even need to really write the over one part. So notice that if you have a negative exponent downstairs, it basically turns it into a whole number. And if you have a negative one as a whole number, it's going to make that expression go downstairs, okay? So that's what I meant by the negative exponent really just changes your position over the fraction bar, okay? That's all it really does, the negative exponent. So we'll definitely see examples of that in a little bit, okay? Now, um, I'm actually wondering if my sketch pad would help me a little bit, but we'll see in just a second. Okay, and then number four is a to the power zero. So a to the power zero, no matter what your base is, as long as your base is a real number, when you raise it to the power zero, you literally get um, one. It doesn't matter if that base is a positive or if that base is a negative, regardless, as long as the base is a, a real number, when you raise it to the power zero, it will turn to a one. Okay, I'm trying to shuffle through my equipment stuff here to find, um, little tiny cord that I cannot find. Okay, let me see this thing right over here. Oh, now let me grab my pen. Okay, let me see if this will work better. Okay, this is just to test it. Um, draw. Oh, yes, that works a whole lot better. Okay, great. I can use this whenever we get to the examples. 
because I'm going to have to do a lot of annotating and <laughs> try to use the mouse is not great. Okay. So making do with what we've got, but I am so sorry for all of the interruptions with this technology here. Okay. We do have another rule, which is number five. Okay. And for number five, it's saying that you can have like a product, like two things that are multiplied together and then an exponent. And you can basically distribute that exponent to both of those things that were multiplied together. Now, I mentioned to you guys on the, um, on the test that that's not the same thing as if there's a plus sign or a minus sign in between. Okay. So you have to be very, very careful there. There's no rule that says if I have an exponent here with the plus or the minus that I can distribute the exponent. Okay. These are not equivalent. Okay. So the only time that you can distribute that exponent is if it's a product, meaning if the A and the B are multiplied together, then you can give each guy the exponent. Okay. And the same thing goes for number seven. If you look at number seven here at the bottom, um, number seven also has a quotient, which is division, and you can distribute the exponent to a quotient. You just can't distribute the exponent when there's a minus, okay? And then it's just using the absolute values. If you do have even exponents, two, four, six, eight as an exponent, um, you don't need to write the absolute value bars. You can just write the expression without the absolute value bars. When the um, exponent is odd, then you would have to keep writing those absolute value bars. We may run into that in this semester. We may not, but you might see it more in calculus. So you're going to get through a whole class pre-cal before you ever see rule eight again, possibly. Okay. So let's go ahead and clear all of this. Um, we can scroll down, hopefully to get to some exponents eventually. So one thing that's super important is that you do understand the difference between the base being negative and the entire expression being negative, okay? So if the base itself is negative, then it will indicate that by using parentheses around that negative. So for instance, this first um, expression that you see here, notice that the negative two is in parentheses. So what that means is it means a negative two times a negative two times a negative two times a negative two. Whereas the one over here, this one here, the only thing that is the base of the exponent is the two. So really, when you see an expression written like this, your brain should separate that from the exponential expression. So all you're doing is doing two times two times two times two. And then the result will be negative, okay? Whereas in the other one, Negative two times negative two times negative two times negative two is a positive 16. So notice that it does matter because you will get the wrong answer if you don't do it correctly. So I noticed on the test, there were some people that were trying to square things. And then they were writing, like, let's say this was what I needed to do. And you were just writing this. And that's not the same thing. Okay. So it does come into play when you're showing your work, whether you're writing that correctly and then whether you're interpreting it correctly, okay? So there's a difference between the negative being included with the parentheses and then the negative not being included. So of course, here's our first example. I'm gonna to try to use my notepad to, to walk through these, okay? So we're gonna use all of our properties to simplify this thing, okay? Um, let me grab the annotate. And we'll use green for number one. So 
So essentially what you can do is you can regroup this. We do have multiplication does have something that's called the commutative property, which allows you, even though all six of these things, and there are six, you have the number, you have this variable A, and you have this variable B. You have a number, this variable A, and this variable B. Okay, so there are six um, factors here that are being multiplied together. And when it comes to multiplication, you can rearrange them in whichever way you want. So for me, I would conveniently group it as negative three times the four, and then I would do A times the A, and then I would do B to the fourth times B to the negative three. So that I have everybody kind of matched up together, numbers with numbers, A's with A's, and B's with B's. And then I would just kind of multiply them in groups. So I would multiply these together, multiply those together, and then multiply these together, okay? So the numbers, we're just gonna use the regular rules for numbers, right? Negative three times four is negative 12. For the A's, you have to use that property where it says, you have to add their exponents. So they do have invisible exponents. There is one A visible, so the exponent is one. So A times A should be A squared. One plus one is the two. Same thing goes for here on the Bs. I should be taking four plus a negative three. And when I do that, I actually end up with a positive one. Now we don't typically write positive one exponents. So in your final answer, you probably won't see that one. You'll just see negative 12 a squared b as the final answer, okay? Now I'm gonna switch colors just because I am not um, writing everything in line and I'm kind of scooting down a little bit. So I'm gonna switch so that it stands out, okay? Here, this is different, B. Notice that everything is in parentheses and you have a cube on the outside. Now we have that rule that says, as long as all these things in here are multiplied together, we can basically distribute the power three. So I can have two to the power three, I can have X to the power three, and I can have Y squared to the power three. And then one of those rules, said that if you have an exponent raised to an exponent, you actually multiply the exponents. So for here, two to the third means two times two times two. X cubed will just be X cubed, but then Y squared cubed should be Y to the sixth, okay? You're multiplying those exponents. So in the end, you end up with eight, X to the third, Y to the sixth. So always remember that if you have an exponent raised to an exponent, you should be multiplying those exponents, okay? That's different than the rule that we used up here where it says if you have one exponent times another exponent, then you add those exponents, okay? So it's different. A base with an exponent multiplied by the same base with an exponent, you add. When it's just an exponent raised to a whole nother exponent and no other base is involved, then that's when you multiply. Okay, let me change my color and we'll go and try the letter C. For this one, I know you've heard the orders of operations like that, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, right? And in there, the please excuse part usually represents exponents. And then my dear represents multiply and divide, right? But we have to do the exponents first before we can do that multiplication, okay? So for this problem, I have to actually address that this expression first that has the exponent before I can multiply it by the three A. Now remember, we have a rule and it said A to the power zero equals one. It doesn't matter what this is. It could be a number or it can be an expression. 
as long as it's all representing real numbers, the whole thing will equal one. So here I have negative four, and then here I have a squared. A is a real number. It represents a real number. So I've got a real number squared, which is a real number, and then that real number times negative four, which is also a real number. So this whole thing is one big, giant, real number. So when I raise it to the power zero, the whole giant thing is just going to turn to a one. It doesn't matter that it's negative or positive. The whole thing turns to one. Then when I multiply 3a times that one, I just get 3a. Okay. Now let me switch my color again so I can get to the next example. So here we have we have two things actually. We have a um, we have a product here, but then we also have this division bar, which means we have a quotient as well. So D is actually a combination of two of the rules. It's a combination of this rule that I drew up here and a combination of this rule that I'm writing now, where you subtract the exponents, okay? Um, no, I'm lying. I am totally lying. Let me undo that. It's not this rule at the top at all. It's actually a combination of this rule and this rule. Okay, so essentially I can take this two exponent and distribute it to this product here, but then I can also distribute it to that quotient down there. So you essentially end up with five squared x to the third squared, and then at the bottom you end up with y squared. And then just put all the pieces together. So five squared is five times five, which is 25. And then x cubed raised to the square, you multiply, so you get x to the sixth. And then really there's like an invisible one here, and one times two is just two. Or just from previous experience, you know that y times y is y squared, right? Okay, so unfortunately what this means is that when I go to write, um, to post the notes, I won't have any notes, like a PDF file to post here. Um, so if you do wanna see these examples again, you will have to go to this point in the recording in order to see these, okay? I apologize that that's the way it is today. Um, hopefully I can get this camera thing to work and we won't have that issue again tomorrow. I think there's some software that I can download onto this laptop I was just given. Um, and then I should be able to share my screen and share the, the camera, what's on the camera. Okay, without actually having to use Zoom's little camera there. Okay, let me clear all of this and let me scroll down. And so it does have the solutions there. It might've done them slightly different, but you'll notice they do have the same exact answers. Okay. So now we're going to get into radicals. Now, radicals are the most common radical that you've seen is a square root. But there are also things called cube roots. And, they're, and beyond cube, it's called an nth root. So like a fourth root, a fifth root, a sixth root, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so there's special names when the... When the um, it's called an index. I don't think they're going to explain it to me yet um, until here. Here we go. So this little letter in is called the index of the radical. And if it's a two, it's called the square root. If that little index is a three, it's called the cube root. And then if the index is anything bigger than three, it's usually whatever number it is with a th root. Okay. So like, let's say that little number was a five. That would be considered the fifth root. Okay, just naming purposes. What's on the inside of the radical is called the radicand. And 
these words you will hear me say throughout the semester. So index and radicand. Index is the type of radical that you're taking. And then radicand is what you're taking the, in, the radical of. So inside, that's the inside, radicand. That's the big takeaway from that symbol, the symbolization of a radical. So of course we do have um, some common misunderstandings, especially since you just applied the extracting roots property, right? You remember the extracting roots property that said, um, and I do wanna point out the difference. So it said something like that if you have X squared equal to a number, then that meant that you get X equals plus or minus the square root of that number. Okay. Notice though that the original never had any square roots in it. We put a square root in there, right? When I was doing the problems myself, I was putting the square root around that and the square root around that, and then ending up with this expression here. Okay. However, when you are given a radical, just the radical by itself, square root of four, you didn't put that square root there. That square root was already given to you, okay? So you cannot say that it's going to be plus or minus. You have to go with whatever it's showing right now. And since it's showing a positive square root of 4, I'm going to end up with a positive 2. This one here is showing a negative square root of 4, so you get the negative 2, okay? So you have to be very, very, very careful. I do want you to know that there are two roots roots, right? Two correct answers. If I'm given x e squared equals 4, I know that x equals plus or minus square root of 4, which means x equals positive 2, and then x equals negative 2, okay? We do know that there are two roots, but I do want you to be careful that if you are given a problem with the square root, whatever sign is there, that's the sign you go with, okay? is I have a lot of people will get problems wrong saying plus or minus, and it's not both if you're not, if you didn't put the square root in, okay? So here are some more um, notes. It says if your index in is even, then you usually get the two answers, right? The positive and the negative. When your index is odd, you don't get a positive and a negative. Whatever it is, is what it is, okay? So notice how here they're doing the cube root of negative eight. The three, the index is odd, three is odd, but because they're doing the cube root of a negative number, you're going to end up with a negative result, okay? So it's different when you have an odd index, which makes sense because you're multiplying an odd number of items together, so if there's an odd number of negatives, you get a negative. If there's an odd number of positives, then you get a positive. However, with the even exponent, if you have an even number of positives, it's of course positive. But if you have an even number of negatives, the answer is still positive, okay? So that's why when you have a positive radicand, what's inside, you can get two answers. But when the radicand is negative, you only get one answer. Okay. Now, if the radicand itself is negative, then there's no real answer to that. And if you try to type it in your calculator, it'll tell you it's not a real number. It literally tells you that. So you cannot have an index of two, which is invisible. That's another thing. When you have a square root symbol, okay? When you have a square root symbol and there's no index given, it's automatically a two. Because this symbol right there, we have been conditioned to call it a square root. So when there's no index shown, it is called a square root. And that's because there is like an imaginary two here. Okay, so there is a two there when there's nothing written. So 
So notice in my expression down here, there's no index given, but it is a two and two is even, right? But the inside is a negative, the radicand is a negative. And that's when your answer is not a real number. And I promise you, if you try to type square root of negative four in your calculator and you hit enter, it says not a real number, okay? And then it, we know already that numbers such as 1, 4, 9, 16, 25 are called perfect squares. And then these kinds of numbers are called perfect cubes. We've already been used to that, okay? And so here are some more properties, but these properties are for radicals. Now, just FYI, when you take this test, all these properties are on the test, okay? Just like how you had the factoring formulas at the, at the beginning of the test, um, and you could always just scroll back up to see those factoring formulas. This test will have all the properties of exponents and all the properties of radicals and some more information that we'll learn later, okay? But you will have access to all of those properties. In case you forget them or you're unsure, you will have um, a visual for these properties. So the biggest one here I'm going to say is number one. Number one is probably the most common property that we will use. However, we will also use properties two and three when we're trying to simplify um, fractions with radicals and when we're trying to simplify number two, when we're trying to simplify the product of radicals. So we do see those quite a bit, okay? Property four is actually just the consequence of property two, okay? If I were to convert them, um, and there's supposed to be another one, but it's not in here yet. Um, there's another property that we'll learn later when we get to the rational exponents, and that one will really help me to derive property four. So we don't see property four a whole lot, okay? And we already know property five because when we were solving equations, I kept telling you, how do you get rid of a square? you do the square root, right? And that's because when you have a square and a square root, they undo each other. So that's why in property five, you see the square with the index in, and then you see the exponent with index in, and they essentially just cancel each other out, leaving you with just the A, okay? And then I, I mentioned before, when you have radicals, if the index is even, you will have a positive answer. That's what the bars mean. And if the index is odd, then whatever the sign is on the inside, that's going to be the same sign you get in your answer. Okay. Um, let's see. And then on the other side, it just has examples with actual numbers plugged in instead of just A, M, and N. So I'm going to do this. I know the solutions are down there, but I'm going to talk it out as we work on these, okay? So let me put on my annotation and let me grab my color. So I am gonna use one of the properties. There was a property in there that said, if I had um, in with the radical A times in with the radical B, as long as these two indexes were exactly the same, I could write them under the same house and since they're multiplied together, I would multiply the radicands together, okay? There was a rule in those properties that said that. So essentially, these are both square roots, so I can write them together in one big square root. And since there's a multiplication in between these two, I would keep a multiplication in between my two radicands. And then you can simplify that. That becomes the square root of 16. And we know the square root of 16 is 4. Um, if the computer is asking you for both positive and, ans and negative answers, then you can say it's four and negative four. If they don't ask you for both, then the only answer you have is positive four because these were positive radicals at the very beginning. Okay, let me switch my color. So now we have this rule for B, the rule that they're using there is when you have M A to the power M 
the exponent and the radical, the index, they're the same. And so they cancel each other out, leaving you with just the index. So in here, this index of three and this exponent of three essentially cancel each other out. So you're only left with the radicand, what was inside the radical. And the same thing for this one. This three will cancel that three, leaving you with just the radicand X. And then here, it's the same thing. This will cancel with this, leaving you with Y. But I don't know what the sign of Y is, but I know that the answer has to be positive. So you see on this one, when you have to put the bars, okay? Because if Y is negative, you need to have a positive answer. And those bars, if you have those bars, will turn it into a positive answer, okay? If Y is positive, then you wouldn't need them, right? Because you would just have whatever the number is, and that's okay. So you don't have to have the bars if you know that the variable is positive. But if you don't know if that variable represents a positive number or a negative number, you have to put the bars here, okay? And it's only if those little indexes and the little exponent are even. Notice here they were odd, and I did not need to worry about the absolute value bar at all. So we're going to scroll down and see, I knew it. They only had four, not four and negative four. When the square roots are given, you use whatever signs are there to get your final answer. It's only when you're solving equations and you put in a square root that was never there, that's when you get the plus or minus. Okay, so it says it has a little bit of a guideline when we're simplifying radicals because the expressions can get really complex and really big, like long. So there is a, um, I guess, a method of doing these in order. So it says um, an expression involving radicals in its simplest form when the following conditions are applied or satisfied. And it says all possible factors have been removed from the radical. So You've done everything you can to reduce that radical as much as possible. All fractions have radical-free denominators. If you do have a radical in your denominator, and it's not a perfect square or a perfect cube or anything perfect down there, so that means you'll still have a radical downstairs. If that happens to your denominator, there is a process to make that radical go away. And that process is called rationalizing the denominator. Okay. Um, and then step three says the index of the radical is reduced. Sometimes you end up with uh, where well, you have one number times another number, and you need to make sure you actually multiply those numbers. That's all it means. Now, here it says to simplify a radical, you need to factor the radicand into factors whose exponents are multiples of the index. And then write the roots of these factors outside the radical. And then the quote unquote leftover factors make up the new radicand. And so we'll definitely see some examples of what I'm talking about here because it's great. It's in words. Fantastic. But what does that mean in problem, right? Um, so it says another thing. Actually, let me show you what that means before I move on because it doesn't look like it's going to give you an example. Let's say you have the square root of 12, okay? What we do is we break up 12 into what's called its prime factorization. And so you do need to know what prime numbers are. Prime numbers are numbers that can only be divided by one in themselves and no other numbers at all. So one and two and three are definitely prime. But every other even number after two is not prime because every other even number can be divided by two. And in order for it to be prime, it can only be divided by one and itself. So all other even numbers are not prime outside of two. 
five is prime, seven is prime, nine, which would be the next odd number, is not prime because nine can be divided by three. Then 11, then 13. Of course, the next one, which would be 15, can be divided by both three and five. So it is not a prime number. Then you get 17, you get 19, the next one is 21, and you get the process, right? 21 would not be a prime because it can be divided by three and seven and so forth, okay? And so what you have to do is you have to basically break up the 12 using one of these numbers. Don't use one because one doesn't help me, okay? But I do know that 12 is an even number, so I know that two goes into 12. How many times? Two goes into 12 six times. We know that this is a prime number, so I'm just going to circle it, meaning that that number is not going to branch out anymore. But if you notice, I jumped from 5 to 7. So 6 is not a prime, meaning it can be broken up. Okay? And what num of these numbers down here at the bottom multiply to give me 6? Well, I know that 6 is even, so 2 goes into it for sure. And 2 times 3 is 6. 2 is one of those prime numbers. And three is one of those prime numbers. So essentially, I can break up the square root of 12 into the square root of 2 times 2 times 3. Now remember, the index here is an invisible 2. Okay? And it said that I want to have the factors written with exponents that have the multiples of the index. So if I had a whole bunch of factors here, I would group them by twos. I and for I fortunately only have one group of two. So this group right here can be written as two to the power two. And then the three doesn't have a group, so it just stays exactly the way it is. And then I can use that one rule that allows me to rewrite this separately. So I basically separated this into two radicals, the square root of two squared and then the square root of three. And so then the square root of two squared, the index and the exponent cancel, leaving me with just the two, but we still have the square root of three. I just didn't write the little invisible two right there. Okay. So this is the simplified version of the square root of 12. Now, if you type in your calculator, square root of 12, it does shoot out the simplified version automatically. Okay. However, if I try to type in the square root of, I don't know, 4802, the calculator is not going to be able to do that for me because the number is too big. And so I need to know this process that's happening behind the scenes so that I could figure out how to simplify that, okay? So I just wanted to make you aware the calculator will simplify a lot of stuff, but there are some things, it does have its limitations. And the bigger that that radicand gets, the less likely your calculator will do it for you, okay? And I just also wanna make sure that you're aware that you can shortcut from here to here. That's what the sentence was telling you up there. So if you have a pair of twos, for every pair of twos you have, one two will come out. And then this leftover business that you have stays on the inside. Okay? So you don't have to go through all of the rules. You can shortcut using that phrase. But the rules are what allow you to do that shortcut. Okay? Oh, I forgot to clear all my annotations. There we go. So not only do we need to know how to simplify radicals, but sometimes you may be asked to add or subtract terms that have radicals in them. And in order for you to do that, you have to have what are called like radicals. Okay. And that means that it doesn't matter what the coefficient is. Remember coefficient, that word? That word just means a number that's multiplied in the front. Normally, when we were talking about coefficients, we were talking about, 
Like if I have an expression that says 3x squared, this number in the front was the coefficient, okay? So here the coefficient is 1, here the coefficient is 3, and here the coefficient is 1 half. It really doesn't matter what the coefficients are. You're looking at the radical parts of these terms. And as long as they have the same index, and every single one of these guys has an index of an invisible 2, right? They all have an invisible 2 index, and they all have the same radicand, the number inside the radical. As long as those match, the indexes and the radicals, radicands, then all three of these things are what they call like radicals, okay? And so you can add them, you can subtract them. Um, you just can't add and subtract things that are not radicals. So for instance, here, notice that they do have the same index, but they do not have the same radicand. Same goes for if I had square root of two, and cube root of 2. They don't have the same index here. So the fact that they don't have the same index means they're not like radicals. Okay? And then you to combine like radicals, it's the same that you do like when you combine like terms. So if I had 3x squared minus 5x squared, I'm just basically telling you how many x squareds I'm going to end up with, right? So 3 take away 5 gives me negative 2x squared. It's the same thing if you have radicals. You're just telling me how many square root of twos you have. Well, I had three of them, and I took away 5, so now I owe somebody two of these radicals. Okay? But you combine them just like you do all other like terms. So here they break this up. Now I showed you how to do it with the primes. They kind of skip that step. So the step that they're skipping here, I'm going to show you, is they're taking this 24 and then they're breaking it up into primes. So that's even. I know 2 goes into it, but this is a prime number. So this is the only one that branches out. This is also still even. This is still even. And then three is a prime number, so I know I have all the ends. And so then if you rewrite this, it would actually be the cube root, and instead of 24, it would be two times two times two times three. Remember what we showed you in the shortcut. As long as you have three of them, why three? Because the index is three, then one of them will come out. But this leftover guy is still stuck on the inside, okay? So whatever the index is, that's how many can come out. Same thing with 48. Let me switch my color here. If I take 48, that is 2 times 24. And we kind of already did the 24, but I'm going to just do it again. Oh, that, not that one. Undo. That should be 3. And so then the 4 through to 48 becomes... 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And so now we have four of them so that 1, 2 will come out. And then this guy doesn't have 4, so it's the leftover and it stays in. Okay? But that's the shortcut way to do it. That way you don't have to think about, oh, is it a perfect cube or is it not a perfect cube? Is it a perfect fourth power? Not a perfect fourth power? What if we give you the index of nine? I don't think anybody knows their perfect ninth powers, right? So <laughs> there's a method to kind of get around that. Okay, now here we go. We're getting into some more fun stuff, okay? So now we have um, X's involved. Not a big deal. You could still do the problem with this is involved. So I'm not going to try to do it doing it their method with the perfect stuff. We're just, excuse me, we're just going to take 75 and break it up. I know that 5 goes into 75 because it ends in a 5. Um, but I'm not sure what that is. Um, I get 1 and 5. 
So 5 times 15 gives me uh, 75. 15 can be broken up into 3 times 5. But 3 and 5 are square perfect, I mean, uh, are prime numbers. So I'm going to break up the square root of 75 into 5 times 5 times 3. All of those circled prime numbers. And then the x, there's three of them. So I'm going to do x times x times x. Okay. And so remember, this is an index of a invisible 2. Okay. So I need one pair in order for the 5 to come out. I need one pair in order for the x to come out. And then I still have the square root with these leftovers inside. So 3 times x, which is just 5x square root of 3x. I get the same thing they do, but I don't have to think about what the perfect squares are or how to write them nicely, any of that. Okay. 24 I've already done, so I'm just going to rewrite the factors here. But it should be 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And then a to the fourth is going to be a, 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 right? And here we need three. So this group of three and this group of three, meaning one two is going to come out for that whole group. And one a is going to come out for that whole group. And on the inside, I still have three left over and the other a left over. And so I end up with two a cube root of 3a. And that's exactly what they have, 2a cube root of 3a. Now here, this one's a little bit different. So you do have to be careful because the index is even. Um, notice that on these other two problems, C and D, the indexes were, um, actually, no, on C, the index was even. So this X right here on the 5X should have actually been in, per, in um, what is it called? Absolute value bars. But they didn't do that up there, which is wrong. They should have, okay? Normally, we don't, but... If the computer's being real, real silly, like real picky, then you probably need those absolute value bars there. Anytime you have an even index and a square root is an even index, you have to have the absolute value bars on stuff that comes out. Okay. So the actual answer to that problem, oops, undo, should have been five absolute value bar of X and then the square root of the three X still stuck inside. Sorry, I tried to use my mouse instead of my notepad. But down here, for some reason, now they're, think they're saying it's important, which doesn't make any sense, okay? So for this one, if you were to be doing that problem, I guess the method I've been showing, um, you would have the fourth root, and then remember, 5x so the fourth power means 5x times 5x times 5x times 5x. We also know that multiplication has the commutative property, which means I can rearrange those. So I can put all the fives together and then all the x's together. And then we do have a group of four, so the five will come out. And we do have a group of x's. Now this five is positive. So it's okay. When the X comes out, it also has to be positive, And I don't know that X is. So that's why you do need these bars around it. Okay. So like I said, it should have been the same case on the other problem. But for some reason, they didn't do that one correctly. Okay. Now we get into the fun stuff. So we do need to know how to simplify the radicals. And you will use that process that I've been showing you on how to simplify those radicals. But once you simplify them, if you have like radicals, they can and should be combined. 
Okay. So if you notice on this problem here, again, I might have a different way to finding this, but you still got to do it. So for me, I would have done some side work and broke up this into 2 and 24, 2 and 12, 2 and 6, and then um, 2 and 3. And so this, this problem here would have become 2 on the outside, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, and then a 3 on the inside. And now the index is a two because there's no index given. This is a coefficient. There was no index given, so it's automatically a two, which means I need pairs. So a pair there and a pair there, and that's my leftover. So I had the two coefficient that was already there. One two that's gonna come out for the first pair, another two that's gonna come out for the second pair, and then I still have this three on the inside. And if you multiply these three twos together, that's where this eight came from. So like I said, they might do that process differently than me, but we still get the same result in the end. Okay. Now for the 20, for the other one, let me use a different color. For this one here, 27 is actually three times nine, which is three times three. So when you have negative, 3 square root of 27, it can be negative 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. All these little prime numbers, right? Then there's no index there, so it's automatically a tiny 2, which means I need a pair in order to come out. So you have the negative 3 coefficient that was there, one 3 that comes out because of that pair, and then the other leftover 3 still stuck inside. And then if you multiply these two coefficients together, you end up with this negative nine that's there. Okay. And then they write this step, but I don't ever write that step. We just combine, right? They're both square root of three. So how many square root of threes do you actually have in the end? Well, eight minus nine is negative one, which can be written like this instead. Okay. So you can write that, but I don't ever write that step with the parentheses. Now, same with the cubes. So 16, I'm just gonna cut to the chase because it takes a long time to do those little trees sometimes. But 16 is gonna be two times two times two times two. And so you have one group of threes, which means one two comes out and one two stays in. And you only have one X here. You don't have a group of X's. So none of the X's are gonna come out. And that's why this X is here. Okay, when it comes to the other expression, 54 is, oh, that one's a little bit harder. Um, six times nine. So it's two times three times three times three. That's for 54. And you do need groups of three. So these three will come out as one single three. And then this two will stay left over on the inside. And you do have X to the fourth. So you do have three and an extra. So these three will come out as an X and then this extra guy is stuck inside. Now you have to be careful here because these are actually not like terms. The radical parts are like, so let me put it another color. So all the rules that you knew about like terms before still apply. And now we have some more information about like terms when it comes to the radicals. So these two terms are almost like terms because the radical parts do match. The index threes are the same and the radicands are the same. So the radical parts match. But if you look at the outsides, this is a two and this is a three X. And we already know that two and three X are not like terms. So these are actually not like terms. So in general, we don't ever ask you to do this step. I don't know why it's asking you to do that because we never do that. If this was what I ended up with, then that would have been my final answer. You can't simplify that any further. These guys don't match and everything has to match. The variables, the exponents on the variables, 
and the radicals. Everything has to match in order for it to be like terms. Okay, now we're going to get into rationalizing the denominator. So we talked about it before, when you're simplifying radicals, your final answer can never have a radical at the bottom. That cannot be your final answer. So if I have a problem like, let me get this little thing. If I have a problem like two over the square root of two, this is not the final answer because it has a radical downstairs, okay? You can never have a radical downstairs in your final answer. It's considered informal, okay? Um, so they're telling you, they're going to start explaining to you the process of how to get rid of that radical downstairs. And that process has a name. It's called rationalizing. So how do you rationalize? your denominator. You turn it into something that doesn't have a radical. And sometimes people will even be asked to rationalize a numerator. Um, there's very special circumstances where you'll ever have to do that. Um, normally, we have to rationalize denominators, okay? But pay attention to the directions in your homework because they could be asking you to rationalize the denominator, which is normal, like that's the typical thing we do, but they may throw you for a loop and ask you to rationalize a numerator instead. So make sure you're paying attention to those um, directions in the homework, okay? Now, in order for me to rationalize a denominator, you have to use what's called the conjugate. Now, they use the conjugate in a real specific manner with the square roots, but essentially, conjugates are the same in trees, but with opposite signs. So anything, no matter what it is, anything here and here, if I have a plus in the middle, and on the other expression, I have a minus in the middle, these two guys are conjugates of one another, okay? It doesn't matter if the front guy is the one with the radical or if the back guy is the one with the radical. They are conjugates, okay? But what you have to be careful with is sometimes this number here can be negative. And when you rewrite the conjugate, notice it's supposed to stay exactly the same. So for instance, if I had negative 2 plus the square root of 5, the symbol in the middle changes, but nothing else should change. It should still be a negative 2 in the front. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Now, let's go see. Okay, we know what a conjugate is, but how do we use them? What do we do, right? The way you um, rationalize a denominator is to make sure that you multiply by the conjugate when there are two terms. Notice it has a minus something and then a plus something. If you don't have two terms, then rationalizing it is a little bit easier, okay? so. If you don't have two terms, you just have one radical all by itself, okay? Then what you want to do is you want to make the, you want, this is what you want. It's hard to say it in words without getting confusing. What you want is you want to create it so that whatever this index is, you have the same index there. So that the two, the index and the exponent will cancel and you just have the radicand right? So if it's a square root, then you need a two here in the exponent. That's your goal. Your goal is to have the square root of m squared so you can get m. Well, I already have an m, so what would I need to make it an m squared? I would need another m, which is why they're saying if you're trying to get rid of the square root of m, just multiply by another square root of m and it will make the square, root of the square root part go away. The same thing for cube roots. If I have the cube root of something, remember what the goal is. The goal is to make it so that I have cube root of m cubed, 
so that that radical can go away. Well, then what would I have to multiply by? It does have to have the same index, but I only have one M and I need three. I would need two more in order for me to get the power three and then eventually no radical. Okay. So they're trying to explain it there. They're saying that if the a equals zero, then rationalizing, meaning if you don't have another number, a second term, you just use the square root itself. For cube roots, you have to choose a rationalizing factor that generates a perfect cube. So basically, what do you need over here so that it's in this form so that the house will go away? <laughs> I'm sure they're going to give us examples next, and so we'll be able to practice that. And of course they do. So the first one they give us is a five over two square root of three. Now you don't have to worry about the two. The two does not have a square root on it. It's just three that has a square root. And it's not two terms either. Two square root of three is just one term. That's different than two plus the square root of three or two minus the square root of three. Once you start throwing in a plus or a minus in the middle, then it becomes two terms. But right now, that two is just the coefficient for this square root of three term. So it's only one term down there. When it's only one term, you're simply gonna try to get rid of the square root on the three. So you have one three on the inside, but it's a quote unquote square root right? Meaning that your index there is two. So my index here is a two. So essentially, I want to have two threes inside the radical so that the radicals can cancel. And so that's what they do is they multiply by another three so that when you multiply this, you get two square root of three times three. And then guess what? These two come out as a single three. And then there's nothing left over, so that's why you don't have any square root here. There's nothing left inside the square root, okay? But because it's a fraction, in order to keep my expression equivalent to the original expression, you have to multiply the bottom by whatever makes sense, right? But then you also have to multiply the top by the same exact thing. Because we know that no matter what number we have, when we multiply by one, it equals that same number. Well, what's happening here is you're multiplying by a really funny one. Because we also know that any number over itself is equivalent to one. So you're going to try to figure out what this fancy weird one is going to look like. In this case, this is the fancy weird one that they're multiplying by which means that my expression is going to be equal to the original expression. And so for the top, the five is on the outside and the square root of three is on the inside. You can't multiply insides with outsides together. You can only multiply outsides with outsides and insides with insides, okay? So that just stays rewritten as five square root of three. And then you can actually multiply the five and the three together which is where they got the six from at the very bottom. So that's where they got this guy at the bottom. Okay. Now over here for part B, we kind of already talked about it, but this time it's a cube. In order for you to get rid of a cube, you're going to have to have three fives in the bottom. And I only have one. So I want to put in two more, right? So that when I'm done, I'll have five and then I'll have three fives. I'll have this one here and then these two that I decided to put in there. But in order to keep this fraction that I'm writing here equivalent to this fraction over there, this has to be a funny looking one, which means the top also needs to be the cube root of five squared. Now again, this two is on the outside, so it's just written as a coefficient. 
And then we know that the threes and the threes will cancel, leaving me with just the five. The two is still stuck there, but you can actually square five and you get 25. And so this is the final answer on that one. I'm sure once I scroll down, it's going to have all of that worked out. It just might look a tiny bit different than the way I did it. And as I've mentioned, it doesn't matter that you do something that looks different than what I do. As long as you're following all of the properties and the rules and you're not breaking any of rule or property, what it looks like to get to the end is not what's important, okay? I'm not worried about that. I just want to make sure that you're explaining how you're getting your answer, like you're showing actual steps. If there's no step to show, just to give you an example, I had this problem on the test. Um, I had like a problem kind of like this, right? And so then a lot of you just put this and that was it. But it doesn't explain what you did. <laughs> if you had arrows, that did this, then I could tell that you applied the distributive property. Or if you wrote down the word distribute, then I knew what you were doing. You were distributing. Okay. But that's what I mean by explaining what you're doing. Okay. If there's lots of steps to show, then all of this jazz is explaining. But when there's nothing to show, you have to explain something <laughs> on how you did that. Okay. So, I don't really have too many of these problems in the future where there's really not much to explain. Normally, they're going to be a little bit more lengthy like these problems, okay? But on this first test, I noticed that that happened a lot with number one because it was just so basic, okay? But we are going to keep climbing up that ladder of difficulty as the semester goes by. So there will definitely be lots and lots of steps to show, okay? Okay. Let's keep going. Now we get into one. Okay. Now, here, what is it saying? Oh, this is a totally different example. Notice they threw it on me for a loop. Now they want me to rationalize the numerator. And so I should not be focusing at the bottom. My eyes should be focusing at the top. What do we have at the top with radicals? And I noticed that I have two terms. That minus sign right in the middle broke it into two terms. And so in order for you to rationalize two terms, that's when you have to use that conjugate. Okay, so you see that word over here on the right, conjugate, which means square root of five and square root of seven stay the same, but the minus turns into a plus, okay? And so then this is the um, conjugate. But in order to keep our expression equivalent to the original expression, what you do on the top has to be the same at the bottom. So notice this red stuff is just one ugly one, the number one. Anything, no matter how ugly it is, over its exact self is just a one. Okay. And so then. They cheated a little bit, used a rule here. Um, they use, let me draw it in there. They use this rule. I know you saw it because we used it in the factoring. We just saw it backwards when we did it in the factoring. When we did a factoring, this was on the left-hand side and this was on the right-hand side. But it's equivalent. So it doesn't matter which sides it's on. You can put it in the other order. And so what they're saying is they're noticing, oh, look, I have the same thing here and the same thing there. And I have the same thing in the backs. And one has a minus and one has a plus. So I fit this description over here on the left-hand side of my equation that I wrote down. So then I'm supposed to end up with the first guy squared and then minus the last guy squared. And that's exactly what they did here. They wrote the first guy squared minus the last guy squared. Okay. At the bottom, you don't have any fancy rule for that. So they just rewrote it. Now, five square root of five squared, the radical and the exponent will cancel, leaving you with this five. Same thing here. The radical and the exponent will cancel, leaving you with this seven. 
And over here, you can distribute, but they don't distribute until the very end because it's possible that this guy can be reduced. But we won't know until we figure out what exactly is on the top. So they actually compute 5 minus 7 first, and they get negative 2. And then once they get negative 2, that's when they realize, oh, now it's obvious that this 2 can reduce with this 2. But you're still left with the negative. And when there's no other number there, there's always an invisible one. Always. Okay. And so they just made that one visible. You could have also done this broke this up into negative one times two. And then you can see where that is coming from. Right, because then the twos are canceled and then this is obvious. So I think that is all we have. I'm going to try. Yeah, that's rational exponents. We're leaving rational exponents till next class, okay? So my computer is acting really weird. I hope <laughs> that I can do this, but I'm going to actually jump into the um, web assign and see what's in there and what it looks like. So we won't be able to do all of P.2 just yet because we've only covered some of the material. Tomorrow's class will cover the rest of the material. But I definitely want to be able to tell you where to stop if you do decide to go into um, the homework and do that today. Okay, so we should know this definition at the front. N is the exponent and A is the base. Here, N is the index. A is the radicand, right? Um, radical expressions can be combined, added or subtracted when they are alike, right? Like radicals. And then these guys, because the number in the front is the same and the stuff in the back is the same, but the plus and minus is different, those are called conjugates. Um, the process to create a radical-free denominator is called rationalizing. Remember that word? This number six we have not talked about yet, so you might not be, I mean, you probably could figure it out, but number six would be a problem that I would wait until we cover the second part. Okay. And then these, you can do them, it says, without using a calculator. I know WebAssign doesn't know whether or not you're using a calculator, but when it comes to the test and I ask you to do the same thing, it's pretty darn obvious that you were using a calculator when you have no idea how to do it without one, okay? So when, what they mean is do the prime tree, right? Break up the 49 into all its primes, break up both of these two numbers into all their primes, and then take out the groups that you can take out, leave the leftovers inside. That's what it means by without a calculator. Practice that process, please, because it will come up on the test. I can guarantee you that, okay? Um, these, it's asking you to use the properties. That one's pretty easy. Seven and seven cancel each other, so you have nine. This one, you might need to break it up into primes first before you can figure out what's going on there. Same thing here. It doesn't tell me with my calculator this time. So this one, I'm pretty sure your calculator will do. But I would suggest use the calculator to check your answer, but actually practice breaking this 45 up into primes and taking out the pairs and all of that good stuff. Keep practicing that process as much as possible, okay? Because it'll be very good to know. This one, the computer, the calculator might not do because the higher that those numbers go, the less likely your calculator is going to simplify. It. And I don't think your calculator simplifies cube roots at all. So you'd have to do the prime tree on this particular problem because of the cube. Um, same thing for all of these. Do the trees for each number and then take out the groups that you can take out. Now these are more, right? There's like extra step. So you do that same process for all those other problems twice. So you simplify this term as much as you can, then you simplify the other term as much as you can, and hopefully they're like terms at the end, and you can actually add them together, okay? Same thing with part B, simplify the first radical as much as possible, simplify the second one as much as possible, 
hopefully they're like terms at the end and you can combine them. If they are not like terms at the end, then just write down what you got after simplifying them individually. Um, here's a rationalize the denominator. Okay, so we did an example like that. Here's a rationalize a denominator again with a cube. We also did an example of that. Here's the rationalize the denominator with two terms in the denominator. And that we haven't done, but we know what to do. You multiply by the conjugate, which in this case would be square root of 21 plus 3. And just make sure you multiply it at the top and at the bottom. And then, of course, simplify it. Multiply it all out and simplify as much as possible. Here's another one with the denominator. Again, two terms again. So make sure you change it to a minus in the middle and then do that on top and bottom and simplify. Now I knew they were gonna do it. <laughs> Notice here they changed it on us and it's now rationalized the numerator, okay? So we do have an example of that, but it would literally be that same process using the conjugate. From 17 downward, do not mess with. From 17 downward, you could probably do 23, but once we learn this information that we're gonna show you about the radical form and the rational exponent form, we're actually gonna show you another way to do these problems, okay? So I would leave 23 alone for now and 24, even though they look a lot like the stuff we were doing before, you could put answers in there, but there may be another method to try later, okay? But you should be able to do 23 and 24 with the information that you know so far, okay? And I think that's it for this assignment. So as far as what to stay away from, stay away from 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Okay, so 17 through 22, and then number six. All those problems, we will talk about how to do those in the next class period, okay? If you would like to wait, until that class period to do this assignment, I mean, I'm not stopping you from doing that, but it's always best for me personally to just get the information and then go practice it right away because it also helps to like um, embed that stuff in your brain so that you retain it later, you remember it later. Whereas if you leave a lot of time in between um, absorbing information and, and applying it and practicing it, um, there, there is a little bit that you'll lose as far as retention. Okay. But you do have the videos, so you can go back and watch the video again. You can fast forward to whichever kind of problem you want to see. Um, but you do have those as a resource. If you do wait to do P.2 until later. Does anybody have any questions? We still have a few more minutes, but we don't have to stay the entire time. But if you have questions, I definitely want to address them now. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, then I will see you guys tomorrow. And tomorrow, we're just going to finish up this section. Um, and then we'll leave the last section for this unit until next week. So during the weekend, when we get to it, you only should be working on homework four and homework five, okay? We won't talk about homework six until, oh gosh, it won't be Monday, right? Monday's a holiday. So on Tuesday is when we'll do homework six, okay? Let me make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, I am. Okay, good. <laughs> so not until Tuesday are we going to talk about this. So during the weekend, I highly suggest you do the 1.4 homework and the P.2 homework so that all you have to do that Tuesday is the 1.5. Okay. And 1.5 is super easy. It's nothing like these other ones. Um, you do use some of the information from P.2, but it's, it's a lot easier, um, 1.5.
Okay. So it won't be too bad. I know you only get one day to practice that one, but it's not too bad as far as the content that's in there. Okay. Well, you guys have a good day and I will see you tomorrow. Hopefully I am going to stop the recording.